And here lies Corinth in the middle of brains and bronze. Here's Corinth in the middle of the greatest philosophers, according to the world, and the greatest athletes, according to the world. And here was Corinth. Corinth was a trade hub. It was the center. The smart people brought stuff that the strong people needed. The strong people brought stuff, obviously not exclusively, but you get the, the point. People on this side needed stuff on that side. What about the Gulf? Well, there's Corinth right there in the middle. Imagine this town that's just way over here, and they need something from over here. Well, they got to go through Corinth. It was a critical town. In verse 24 of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible I therefore so run, not as uncertain, uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into sub, unto subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Can we pray one more time together tonight? Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us, for your kindness, for your mercy, all that you've done in our life and our spirit. I pray that you would anoint. Our, our service for the remainder of it, you would anoint me that I may preach what thus saith the word of the Lord. Give us some instruction tonight. Lead us and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to preach on the title, Run That You May Obtain. So this is modern day Corinth. And if you see uh, this dot right here, it's kind of hard to see maybe, but there's this tiny, tiny little strip of land. Modern day Corinth is only about three miles away from uh, ancient Corinth. Corinth was a town that was placed very strategically. It's right in between two different main portions of land. You have Athens that's right here. What, what picture did I give you a second? Was it a zoomed in one or a, a further out one? Is that the second one? All right, so you can see Corinth. It's only about 25 miles from Athens. Well, for us, that's like, I live 25 miles from here almost. You know, that's not a big deal. Just jump in the car and go. But transportation didn't work that way. So 25 miles, that was a, that was a long journey. Has anybody ever tried to walk 25 miles? What about a marathon? 26.2 miles? Hey, these marathoners could just get there, you know? Two hours, that's what the top, the top one is. I ran a half marathon that I might talk about in a minute. And so 13.1 miles, and it took me two hours and 17 minutes. And there was people finishing the full marathon at that time. So if you could run a marathon, you just hop over there and back, no big deal. But for most of us, it ain't happening. You can go back to the other picture if you want. Thank you. So he's riding to a church that's right here on this spot writing to the church in Corinth. Now, some things that are interesting about Corinth is not only was it strategically placed, it was in every war that happens, this was the town that they wanted. They wanted this town because this town was the bridge that, that made these two pieces go together. And not only that, it was also a, a great trade place because it had two different gulfs on both sides of it. So it had two gulfs and it had two main pieces of land on either side of it. Now, on one side of it, further down over here in this, this area right over here, is where um, uh, Peloponnese is. So, the, this, let me read this real quick about the Olympic Games. Everybody knows the Olympic Games. This, that Peloponnese is where that started. It goes back, as they estimate now, according to the Olympic Games official website, it goes back around 3,000 years to the Peloponnese in ancient Greece. Sports contestants organized at Olympia took place every four years, as they do now, and they eventually acquired the name the Olympic Games. Now, the earliest events were just sprints, which makes tons of sense. Every single person in here was a child. Some still are. 
I remember very vividly, we would get to school, recess would happen, and somebody would say, but I'm faster than you. I think I'm faster than you. And then we would have a showdown of a sprint right then, right there. And people would talk trash to each other. Let's organize this. After school, we're going to run in a race. Right? You had these things. It, as you got older, it might have escalated to fights. But it, it started off as racing. And that's kind of what happened in the Olympic Games, too. It started off as racing. And then somebody was like, we should also fight. That should also happen. <laughs> that, so that began to happen. But the running, they had a 200-meter dash, a 400-meter dash. And then they had just this other one that was a random uh, thing depending on their arena they're in. So it was a, a more of a cross-country race, a longer race, and the distances varied on that. But if you're racing, it doesn't matter how far it is, right? You say, here's the starting point, here's the finishing point, and the objective is the same. Start together, somebody finishes. And only the person that finishes first gets gold. That's it. Even today, in 2023, about to be 2024, in the Olympic Games, only the one that gets first gets the gold. Right. And that's it. That's all she wrote. And they added, on top of running, they decided, we should see who can jump the furthest. I mean, you can tell it's literally just little kids in an elementary school saying, I can jump further than you. Let's test it. They added wrestling, and then boxing, disc throwing. I mean, every time you go to a lake, let's see who can skip rocks the most. Let's see who can skip rocks the furthest, right? It's just these, these changes of competition. So then they added this uh, version of mixed martial arts, and then uh, they ended up with this uh, horse and uh, chariot racing. All these things were happening amongst the Palapanese. And that is on this southern area of Corinth. But east of Corinth is Athens. And Athens was nothing like that. Athens was uh, philo philosophical. In fact, the quote that I had on them says, Classical Athens was one of the most powerful city-states in ancient Greece because it was a center for democracy, arts, education, and philosophy and was highly influential throughout the European continent uh, particularly in ancient Rome. So on one hand, we have this, you know, hey, I'm stronger than you. I'm faster than you. And then on the other hand, we had Athens, which is even today still the, um, the, the name of the, I think it's, I didn't write it down, agropacy, something to that effect. It's their, that symbol that you see. Uh, people usually associate it with imagination. That came from, from the statue or, or building, rather, that was in Athens. And it's still to this day regarded as the base for things like education, for philosophy, for science, for math, for drama, for literature, for art. And here lies Corinth in the middle of brains and bronze. Here's Corinth in the middle of the greatest philosophers, according to the world, and the greatest athletes, according to the world. And here was Corinth. Corinth was a trade hub. It was the center. The smart people brought stuff that the strong people needed. The strong people brought stuff, obviously not exclusively, but you get the, the point. People on this side needed stuff on that side. What about the Gulf? Well, there's Corinth right there in the middle. Imagine this town that's just way over here, and they need something from over here. Well, they got to go through Corinth. It was a critical town. Now, if we could just use our, our basic understanding of how trade works, we could figure out some things that were definitely in Corinth. They had trades, not finance in the way that it is now necessarily, more like a bartering system. But it was still, I give you this, you give me this, right? Well, what happens in those environments is the next piece that comes is things of promiscuity, drug trafficking, Exchanging under the table drugs, sexual perversion. All of these things are pieces that was most definitely in Corinth. We know this because Paul was very blunt about it. He was like, hey, 
church in Corinth, you are struggling with this and this and this. And it was all filled about things that they should, how they should behave themselves in church and how they should behave themselves when they're talking to other people. And then, of course, it was saying, hey, your, your flesh is longing to do these sexual acts that are impure and your spirit is longing to do these things that are of God. You've got to figure this thing out. So 1st and 2nd Corinthians were written to a group of people that knew what strength looked like. That knew what running looked like. They were not ignorant of that thing. So when Paul tells them as we read it again tonight, know you not that they which run in a race run all but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. That meant something to those people. They said, yeah, I I remember. Maybe it was people from their their community that has won before and won the crown. So it meant something. It it was a valuable thing that Paul was expressing to them. In verse 25, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. The Amplified Bible explains that verse like this. Now every athlete who goes into training and competes in the games is disciplined and exercises self-control in all things. They do it to win a crown that withers, but we do it to receive an imperishable crown that cannot wither. So when Paul says in verse 26, I therefore so run, It meant something. There was value to the people that he was writing it to. Not as uncertainly. I'm not just wandering around. I see my finish line. I'm going to achieve my finish line. So fight I. Not as one that beateth the air. Again, what he's trying to tell this, uh, this church, this assembly, is that you've seen the games. You've seen the people fight intensely as if their life, and in most cases their life, did a, depend on it. You've seen the things that they've endured. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. The scripture isn't just telling us to run aimlessly, but rather run with a purpose. The race is the most insignificant piece to the whole thing. Yeah, it's the one that determines who gets the crown. But everything leading up to the race is what's critical. I, I did run in 2009. I ran a half marathon, and most of you all have per- probably heard me talk about it. And it will always be in the past because I never desired to do another one for the rest of my life. My knees still hurt, like 14 years later. I couldn't just run. I couldn't just say, hey, let's get here, let's run. I had to train, wake up early. Stay out late, running, trying to see what my average time was so that I could set a pace so that whenever I started actually running it, I knew what kind of pace I could keep up with. I had to do these things so that I could be prepared. I had to eat a certain way. I had to drink a certain thing. I had to, to work on certain, uh, certain things that I needed to work on. My, my body had to change. I had to get new shoes. All these things had to happen just so I could run. Now imagine that the stakes weren't, I was just trying to beat the people I was with. Now imagine the stakes are, this is how I provide for my family for the rest of the year or next four years if that's the case. The stakes are now a lot higher. So whenever Paul wrote to this church, he said, run. Not aimlessly, but Run. Run with purpose. Run with intent. And while you're preparing to run this race, which we all know to be our life, that's what he was explaining, this marathon that we're in is our life that we're in. He said, run that. But while you're running your life, while you are living your marathon of life, don't forget about the spiritual diet that you need to partake of. Don't forget about the words that you say and the actions that you take and how those need to align. Don't forget that while the end purpose is eternal life, there's things that we must do to obtain and win an incorruptible crown. What I'm talking about tonight is the baton is in your hand. 
You get to run the race. I get to run the race. I am in control of the race that I'm running. And if I'm satisfied with the miles that I'm, uh, that I'm on pace for, then I'm satisfied. But I don't want to be satisfied with the pace that I've set. If I'm at a 10-minute mile, I want an 8-minute mile. Now, how does that relate spiritually? What that means is if I'm only seeing this set of miracles happen, I want all of them unfolded. If I'm only seeing this uh, financial thing taken care of, I want all of them unfolded. Understand that the purpose that we're trying to obtain, there's got to be something to change in us. There has to be. We have the same anointing that the disciples did. We have the same power that the apostles did. So we have to figure out how to run more efficiently. We have to figure out how to diet spiritually. And it's hard to look in the mirror and say, Jared, you need to get rid of this and you need to get rid of that. It's hard. We don't usually see it in ourselves. No problem seeing it in everybody else, right? But we have a hard time looking in and saying, where do I need to strengthen? Where do I need to get better at? What are my strengths? When you go into an interview, it's asked, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? How many times have you ever done that spiritually? What are my strengths? What do I bring to the table that I have a talent in? What are the areas that I'm weak in? Can I evaluate those weak things? Can I be aware of those weak things? We talk about, I know these analogies are kind of running around, but they they all work. We're talking about putting a fence, a perimeter around ourselves. The purpose of that is to say, this is the area I'm weak in. I got to build a fence right here because I'm weak in this. But if we don't take time to say, I'm weak here, We're not going to build up our walls successfully there. If we don't take time to say, I'm a slow runner, where do I diet to get better? How do I train? We won't improve. If you're able to, Heather. Today, the baton is in our hand. I want to grow in the Lord. We didn't reach the heights that I wanted to reach as an assembly in 2023. What could I have done differently? Sometimes the answer is nothing, and it's just how it goes. But for me, the answer is definitely many things. And I can lie to myself and say, I work really hard. I'm tired, right? Excuses. I'm worn out. Well, I'm not getting any younger. I'm not going to feel less worn out as the years go on. At some point, I have to decide, what am I willing to do so that when my race is done, not only do I get the crown, but everybody that I had an opportunity to influence, that when their race is over, they get a crown. I'm talking about the people on the fringes that, that we all know that can come to some events but have a hard time making it to, to church. And that's, that's okay. I want them to keep coming to that event. But I want the wall to break so that it stops being just coming to the events and starts being, I'm a part of this assembly. But what do I need to do to bridge that gap? What do I need to do to be in the place that Corinth was? Think about what we're at right now spiritually. You want to tell me we're not just like a spiritual, a spiritual version of Corinth? We're literally on the bridge of righteousness and unrighteousness. We're literally right here on the gulf of people trying to get to eternity and struggling to pay their light bill. We're, we're in a pretty good spot for all the Corinthians to make a lot of sense for us. I want to run my race more effectively than I did in 2023. But it has to be more than me saying, I want to run my race better. I can't just say, I want to run my race better, and then I'm faster. It'd be great, wouldn't it? I would like to lose 10 pounds this week. And then you're like, I fit into my clothes. You know, it's just, woohoo! But I got to do something about it. Spiritually, I got to do something about it. Can we pray together tonight? Lord, I ask.